I guess the more you start to know me, the more you uh, know I believe in interactive services. So I brought my Jenga game with me this morning. Jenga. Jenga? It's Jenga. Okay, I didn't even say the name of it. So Kenzie asked me if it was the Tower of Babel. It is kind of leaning a little bit. So I'll, I'll read back from my notes, but the last couple of weeks, somebody had asked me, or has happened several times, um, where frustrations of the church have been brought up. And uh, one person told me church should be the place that we can bring our questions, bring our doubts, bring our whatever, right, to this family. And I thought, yeah, that's, that's interesting. And then later on in the week, this other fella, his, his daughter was talking to another uh, girl, and they were younger. And the one girl told the other girl that her parents weren't Christian enough. And she had attended a church, the one girl that told the other girl this. And you can imagine the, the dad's, uh, I'm going to call it disgust, <laughs> like he was kind of upset how one child could tell another child who was more Christian and who shouldn't be attending church and who should be attending church. And then it's stuff like that that I recognize can really turn us off about church. It can turn us off about wanting to share anything, to go anywhere, and we just start building building walls. And so then what I thought is there's questions um, that build us up and there's questions that erode, right? And we need to understand why we're asking these questions or why we have these doubts and what they're actually doing. So over the last couple of years, um, I've noticed with technology, uh, who do we look to for most of our answers? Siri. Siri or Google. <laughs> hey Siri, <laughs> hey Alexa, uh, hey Google, and we type it in and then we just, we're, we're getting fed from this thing. And, and not very often I'm like, hey Joel, what about this? And then I get Joel's answer and then, you know, okay, what about this? Right, Nolan, I want to know, and then you tell me, and then I'm like filtering all of this stuff, and then I'm like, oh, I'll come up with the answer. No, what do we do? We just turn to the key keyboard, and then that's our answer, and we run with it. So what I thought of when I was looking at this, this Jenga game, is if you, if, and I'm going to say you have a, a question, say, about homeschool or public school, right? And you were to look at that question, that doubt, or that query, whatever that is, would that be at the top of this pile, or would that be down at the bottom of this pile, down at the foundation of this thing? If this is you, and you want to say public school is the only way, you have to send your kid to public school, otherwise you're a nobody. And the next person is like, if you send your kid to public school instead of homeschooling, and you get these contrasts, right? And we need to understand when it comes to your faith, then would be up here, right? I can take one of these and I can stack it up there. I can take another one from in here. And really, some of these questions, they're not going to affect the whole integrity of the tower. I can just keep stacking these things up there and I'll be there. If I start, and it's not going to work on this, this floor, but if I start pulling away things from the bottom, you can already tell how tight it is. Now, let's say, hypothetically, that the bottom in our belief system is God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Them things should not be up for debate, right? They're a foundational truth. If you start removing Jesus from the equation, and then you start moving the Holy Spirit from the equation... And your whole life then is standing on God. And then what do we do if we believe in evolution? Or we don't believe in a God? Then we've eroded at the whole foundation to life. And, and basically, again, I'll repeat myself in here when I'm going through my notes. But I said, if you do that, then what is the meaning to life? What is the meaning to death? What is the meaning to anything if we don't start with the foundation? So that'll be kind of where we're headed. So... What I wanted to do is this going to be a part one kind of series, and I'm going to look at all of your questions in the coming weeks, and I want to answer them. So Shane said, I don't have any questions, and I said, well, do you remember when we were talking about Easter, and it says in the Bible that Jesus was in the ground for three days and three nights, and then we were calculating up the time, and you're like, wait a minute, we went to Good Friday service, and then we're calculating, and we're like, that's two nights and three days, not three nights and three, three days. And sometimes that can make a question right up until we dig into it and we understand that there was a Friday Sabbath and a Saturday Sabbath stuck together back in that day. 
And so then all of a sudden, the whole timeline of the Bible makes sense. You're like, oh, I actually don't doubt anymore. It's true. So some of them things we do need to dig into all the while, sometimes uh, blind faith. And we have blind faith in gravity. We have blind faith in wind. We have blind faith in a lot of things that we don't need to necessarily dig into. So I said, we'll hand it out the papers. We'll write our doubts or our questions. And uh, Kenzie was watching a movie. We all ended up watching it. I don't know if anybody's watched Lee Strobel's Case for Christ. Has anybody watched that movie? It's a fantastic, fantastic movie. I would highly recommend. And basically, this Lee Strobel is an atheist. His wife converts to Christianity very, very blindly, right, in the sense. And she's like, this thing is true, and she's sold out. And Lee basically is like, I have now lost my wife. And he gets mad and frustrated, and he's a detective journalist. And he sets out with the sole purpose to basically rip apart Christianity and prove that it's untrue. And, and as he is going down that path and talking, he's never getting the answers that support his worldview, that there is no God, there is no Jesus, and that the crucifixion didn't really happen. Nothing proves the story. So he starts even getting more frustrated. And one of his fellow workmates is a Christian. And he starts lashing out at this person. And finally, the person is like, aren't you a detective? And he's like, yeah, follow, follow the evidence to its, its bitter end. And then write the story, win or lose, right? But sometimes as we hear things, we're already writing a different story. We're like, that's not true. And I'm going to write my own narrative. Or I'm going to look up on Google. And I'm going to see what it tells me. And I'm going to run with that story instead of actually searching out the truth. So the fellow, the co-worker says to him, I'm tired of you blaming me. I'm tired of you blaming Christians. And I'm tired of you blaming the church. Follow the evidence, write the story, win or lose, right? And I think once in a while, with our faith, that's what we need to do, right? And so I said, will you enter into agreement to chase this doubt, whatever you have wrote down, or whatever our doubts are, doubt or questions, to its logical end? And when you do that, will you not just accept the answer, but will you align with it, right? That's the other thing. Sometimes, again... I've had people in my life, they will say there is no doubt in my mind that there is a creator. We just shouldn't call him God. He would know that there's a creator, but not want to align his life with that fact, right? So there is sometimes that. So will you accept and align with the answer? Win or lose, write the story based on the facts. And I do think that a healthy church is going to be a church that, that we can bring up our questions and, and our doubts. And it's not... Um, that we want to erode anything, we want to promote growth through that. So uh, this is where I just wrote, was talking to somebody about, said we should be able to bring our doubts to the church. And then I just asked this follow-up question, do you feel like you can bring your doubts and questions up? And some people would say to me, especially Melissa, because she knows me very well, I asked Paul who I was last night, he gave me a little bit of a description. Um, Melissa just sums it up that I'm Dutch. That covers a lot of, <laughs> Ginger's laughing, that covers a lot of um, areas that are, are could handle some growth, let's call them, okay? So, um, sorry, do you feel you can bring your doubts and questions up? There might be where Melissa would answer this question knowing me that she would be like, I can't bring up some questions and doubts to you. There might be some other people that look at me and they'd be like, you're not very approachable. Or if I do approach you, you're very abrupt or you're very whatever. And so then I asked Paul last night, what is my nature? Right? And I was thinking Ginger taught me a little bit in school. She's a little bit older than me, but we would kind of grow up in close neighboring communities. So Paul starts to know me. Kelly, you know me very well, right? And I said, if I gave you an option of what type of person I am, am I an impromptu person or am I a planner? Okay, Ginger, what am I? A planner. Through and through. <laughs> so what happens when you have a planner and you, you bring something to them and you're like, here's a question. Here's a, I need, I need, I need something from you. And, and what's a planner going to do? Revolt and rebel and push back. Revolt? Oh, man, you are using <laughs> Melissa terms here. Revolt and rebel and push back. Okay, very accurate. 
I could have asked Melissa for all that. What do I need to ask you? <laughs> okay, but that's true. So, yeah. <laughs> so, but once people know that, right, like Jesse, you're starting to know me and you're like, I have a question and I'm going to write it on a piece of paper. And because you're a planner, you're going to look at that piece of paper over the next week or two and, and you're going to put some thought into it. And as a planner, I have an A, B, and a C. And if A don't work, I've already calculated on plan B. And lots of times when you get down to C or D and you've calculated that all, when somebody brings doubts to you, is that part of a calculated plan? Is a doubt part of a calculated plan? Never. It's not. Right? So now when somebody brings me a doubt and they said, is the church a place to bring your doubts and questions? And you all say, amen. Is Chris a place to bring your doubts and questions? No. <laughs> but does Chris recognize that he needs to learn that? He does. Okay? He needs to learn that I don't need to be standoffish. I need people to be like, I can trust him, um, but I need to make sure that I maybe approach him a little bit differently. Or, right, you're going to work You're gonna work with me. Melissa's like, oh, yes, I have worked with him for 20 years. Damn. I wrote, I wrote some footnotes here because when we talk about the church, I have heard and maybe when I look at these, there'll be none of them here. But in the circles that I run, I nonstop hear about frustrations of the church. And some of these frustrations are legitimate, and some of them are truly unmet expectations. Somebody rolls up into the relationship, and they're like, Paul, I expect this from you, I expect that from you, and I expect this type of friend, and always listening, always doing, always whatever. And then all of a sudden, you don't measure up to that, then all of a sudden, you're a bad friend. No, no. What were my expectations? Were they So now we have expectations of the church, right? And there's areas where the church have failed, but I want to really dissect that because if we don't, we're not going to move past and build something stronger. If we let them words hang as the church has failed, the church hasn't done this, the church hasn't done that, whatever the case is, is that a growth word or any of them phrases or is them erosion phrases? They are tear down erosion phrases. Has the church done good in this world as a collective? Yes. Has the church went wrong in this world as a collective? Yes. How are we going to do it? Are we going to be, and I'll, I'll repeat myself in here, are we going to just be a bunch of complainers about it? Or are we actually going to do something about it and start within? People say this, the church is horrible. I don't believe in Christianity because of this bad person. And he goes to church and I'm like, oh, this is fantastic. You have the opportunity to be the very first one, the very first good one. If you have wrote off 100 people, but you still actually see the good in the collective of a church, why would you not want to be the very first good one then and make a difference? Nobody can usually answer that, right? We just want to complain. We want to tear down and then we want to move on instead of build up. Okay, so footnotes here. Establish what the church is. Uh, and we're going to turn to Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. <clears throat> and this isn't quite what the church is, but I just wrote something here. It is the body of believers. And then Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. What are some fruits of the church? Remember, who is the church? You. We are. So when the church fails, the first place we should look is inwardly. Right, And then we can move out from there to the local church, which we would call this building. And then the universal church we'll call the collective group of our conference, Bruce said. That's more of a universal, right? Not universalism, but universal church, our conference, other evangelical churches, on and on. So we always take this, uh, these verses and we apply them singular. But I had started down the road of applying them to the church and so we're going to read them. Uh, sorry, Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Ephesians 1. Better have had the... Oh, no, this is actually the church. Yeah, this is the first one. Sorry. Okay, so 21 and 20, or 22 and 23. God has put all things under the authority of Christ and has made him head over all things for the benefit of the church. And the church is his body. It is, it is made full and complete by Christ who fills all things everywhere for or with himself. And Paul had brought up something last night. 
He said, in this world where everybody promotes equality, 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 equality. And again, don't sharpen up your pitchforks and light your torches and come take a run at me. But when, when God is used in the same sentence of the church and they have this equality thing there, is God equal to the church? Is Jesus equal to the church? He's the head. He's the head of the church, right? So there is this co-union, this union thing, but there is this headship. And we need to remember that if the church starts going at things all on its own, if the church leadership starts going at things all on its own, if the husband starts going at things all on his own, if the wife starts going at things all on his own, if people, if the people do this thing, what's going to happen? Right? Equal. We're not saying that it's not equal, but there is something there that we need to remember. If Jesus is not the head then we're going to go astray. So we need to remember that. Right down into our marriages, Jesus is the head of the man. The man is the head of the wife. The wife is the... And, but equal, okay? So don't 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 get upset with me. That it, There has to be an order, and we're starting to forget that in our free-for-all world. Um, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the Holy spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control there is no law against these things now should that title be on the front door of the church right because why because the church is who we'll read these verses singularly like this is something that you want to display in life but that should be actually on the front door of the church so that every person that walks through the church they understand what we should be in the church. And then all of a sudden, the collective church, not just the local person as a singular, will flow out of that, right? Because we stop at this of a person. Well, what happens if a person fails? Then we sit there and broad brush the whole church. The church has failed. No, no, no. The person has forgot this. The person has forgot this. Establish what the church is not. It is not malicious. It is not vindictive. It is not lying. You are the church, and the next time you go and do a business dealing, and you are malicious, and you are vindictive, if you start gossiping about your neighbor, if you start lying in whatever you're doing, what what is that? What is that for you as the singular church? Good church, bad church? Bad. Bad church, right? We need to hold our heads high and be like, I can wear that. If I'm being bad... Then, then something behind me is going to get the rap for it too. Uh, Galatians 5, 19 uh, and 21. <clears throat> so we're just going to back up. When you follow the desires of your sin sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and in case I missed anything on this list that pertains to you, they put it in there, and other sins like these. And we have went over these verses before in sermons, um, but it's always been geared to the person. And I'm like, as a person that rolls up underneath the collective, we need to make sure that this is a representation of what the collective is and what the collective isn't. The word church in translation of the Greek word echolitia which is defined as assembly or called out ones. Has anyone ever had a doubt about the church? And then we had talked about a footnote to the local church or to the universal church. So I don't know, again, if somebody's wrote this on a piece of paper, um, you can holler it out, but I wrote four examples here. The church is not doing what it should. I've heard that lots. Has anybody else heard that? Yeah, okay. Um, the church has went astray. The church has failed me, okay? So unmet expectations, it could be a real thing, but now we, a person is unhappy, the church has failed them. And the church has failed in general, okay? We don't know what general is yet, but I've heard the church has failed. The church has failed in general. And I'm like, well, what is general? Let's dig into that a little bit. So you entered into an agreement with me that we would chase down these doubts and questions to their logical end and write the story, win or lose, right? Win or lose. So what did you mean on question one, two, three, and four? 
when I said the church is not doing what it should, the church went astray, the church has failed me, or the church has failed in general, is this a people problem? Usually. Usually? I, got, I put a lot of thought into that, like a lot. <laughs> I'd be pulling wrenches on the truck, and then I'd end up on the drill, and then I'd end up somewhere else, and everything I turned to, it was that same question. Usually. And then I thought about it enough, and I'm like, usually almost turned into always after the day or two that I thought about it. There are people problems. Has anybody felt the church has failed them? Raise your hand. Well, I suppose at some point. In at some life, point yeah. in your life, okay? There's a lot of hands up, okay? We get the idea. Now, about that same circumstance that you're thinking about, did the church fail you? Or did some miserable person, I'm not even going to say miserable person, some person like myself who maybe said something before thinking mm -hmm. right sometimes we do sometimes we do that <laughs> right especially if you're dutch <laughs> or german or german <laughs> i'm dutch and melissa's german so <laughs> that covers a lot of bases that covers a lot of bases okay so is this a people problem the local singular church who we are, the person that offended you, the thing that went astray. Why do we broad brush the church? Why do we run from the church? Okay? Again, the people that are closest in my life, one fella actually went bankrupt from somebody in the church swindling him. Oh Is that person a representation of the list that we, we read? Of, of joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness? That's a rep representation of Satan. Uh, of anger, of selfish ambition maybe, of dissension. That's in that list, right? So we need to remember that. Stop saying that the church, right? That person, right? That person. Okay. Understanding your nature. And this is where I'll repeat myself. Are you a planner or an impromptu type person? Are you a complainer or a getter done type? Do we have any complainers? Do we have any people that are known complainers in here? I like to complain. Okay. Are you being honest? Oh, yeah. Wow. Good for you. That is fantastic. Okay. So when we recognize that, would you like to change that sometimes? I have seen that in you. You started to change from when you were younger. And when we recognize these things, then we can start to do something about it. And I basically, the last thing, you've all heard the phrase glass half full or glass, ha glass uh -huh. half empty. We did that yeah. When you woke up this morning and looked out the window, did anybody be like, this day sucks? No, it was beautiful. That's fantastic, because if somebody said this day was awful, I was like, wow, this day, this... Uh-oh! <laughs> right, but that's a... How do we see the world? How do we see the things around us, right? These are building blocks. And yes. as a church, you might think today we're pretty, we're pretty, uh, what do you call it? Baby, baby food, baby level. But you don't get up to these big things without covering these bases off. About strength in the church, about unity, unless we talk about all the little things that go into it. So this is where I just said my nature is a planner and as such i like to know what is going to happen next so i can plan a response or i can understand what is accepted uh, of the group or of me right jesse and me have done some work together i've actually asked him what is expected of me right i don't want to guess i want to know and then being a planner is probably a bit of a self-protection security mechanism of mine and a planner is the opposite of an impromptu. I know that. So when somebody says an impromptu thing to me, the best thing I can do is be like, I might not know the answer to that. I'm going to work on it. And I can't just regurgitate something to you. If I do, the chances of it being wrong or the chances yeah. of me just not being genuine, it, it gets up there a lot higher. And I want to be a genuine type person. Sometimes planners don't know how to respond to doubt because it is not part of the calculated plan. Right? I was talking to a cousin of mine yesterday, and oh my goodness, mind blowing what this guy knows, like crazy. And then we started talking about the faith of a child. And for his faith, for his walk, he, he, might, have, he might have a few of these that he dug into, and he found the answers. And maybe my walk, I had one. Or Shane, he wrote a dot on his paper. Currently, where he's at in life, he's like, I just... I just don't have a question right now. And that's fair, right? So we got to understand why we're digging into things. And me and, and me and my cousin, we talked about this. 
Are you, are you digging into this stuff to be the smartest person in the room? Has anybody dealt with those types of people? Mm -hmm. They just want to learn something so they can go like this and they can just prove how smart they are. Uh -uh. If God takes you down that road to learn and to grow so that you can share with others, great. But if it's to be the smartest person in the room, I would caution. I would yeah. have a caution or a red flag there. Okay? And, and he is. He's the type that he, he just wants to share and learn and grow. So his, his heart is in the right frame of mind, in my opinion. Okay. Doubts can also be impromptu and be brought up along the way. And that also can deviate from the plan. All that being said, doubt is uh, an important step in growth if used correctly. And that's where I put, if not used correctly, it can be, it can erode. So we need to make sure we're aware of that. When you try to filter everything through wisdom and discernment, when I hear the word, the church should be a place to bring our doubts, I don't think, no, that doesn't seem right. The first thing I thought of, and you guys have all heard my broken record speech on Thomas. As soon as the person told me the church should be a place where we can bring our doubts and our questions, I just, boom, Thomas. Thomas the... Trained in church to say the doubter. And now, as I thought about this, I'm like, Thomas, the questioner, we've established that in my brain. I believe that's accurate and true. I think he just had some questions. And then a couple of days ago, as I was writing that, I'm like, whoo, maybe Thomas was Dutch. No, he wasn't Dutch. But maybe he was a, maybe he was a planner. Maybe Thomas was a planner, right? We don't get all those details to his life, but he definitely had some questions and he wanted to be sure. He was a thinker. He, he was wanted a, a deeper understanding. Right? He was a thinker. And again, I told somebody, somebody's like, how do you, how do you do the things you do? You're not, you're not smart enough. And I'm like, God hasn't told me I needed to be smart yet. God told me that I just needed to have the faith like a child. And you're like, well, that's pretty elementary. And I'm like, yes, it is. Right? You want to stick me in a room? I, I've read a quote from Charles Spurgeon and I was looking on a website and I'm like, wow, that guy seemed like he was fairly smart. <laughs> and there was a, a place for that. And then God has a place for, and we're going to cover it off today, the faith of a child. And they are what? Equal. If not, the faith like a child. If not, right? So why does, why are we trying to learn these things? <clears throat> and, uh, okay, so maybe Thomas was a planner. And then there's Peter. Peter. The one Jesus would look at and be like, Peter, really? We're going down this road again? Are you sure, Levi? I'm pretty sure we've been down this road before, but you want to go down this road again? Right, Peter? Really? Peter the guy? So then I said, uh, and Peter, Peter the one Jesus would look at and say, really? We've been down this road. Really? Again? we got to do this? John 21, 15 to 17. <clears throat> Twenty-one, fifteen 15 to 17. After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Mm -hmm. And so I thought of that, and I thought there would have been a chance here that if somebody asked you the same question three times in church, how's, how's, how's your life? Um, how's your work? How's, how's your marriage? How's your marriage? How's your marriage? And you're like, you asked me that twice already. Leave me alone. Me and Paul had a great talk about this sometimes when people are reaching out to help us. And sometimes we're like, uh-uh, <laughs> uh-uh, don't you dare try to help me. All the while, on the inside, we're screaming out for help, right? Somebody gives us help and we're like building the wall. We're like, don't, don't interfere, don't interfere. So it depends how we do it. Humbly, we need to have that hand around maybe. Say, how you doing? things going on I can help you with right instead of we don't want to be the finger pointers so he asked this three times and then I wrote something here in my notes before I actually found the verses in the Bible okay and then I read the commentary and I was like well it kind of lined up with what I said so I got to read this Jesus asked Peter three times if he loved him 
The first time Jesus said, do you love me in Greek agape, mm. right? And I've used that agape, phileo, storge, love all the time because I find them very interesting because all we do is love, 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 right? I mean, more than these. The second time Jesus focused on Peter alone and still has them the same word translated in Greek. So sometimes we have these questions about Christianese things and we don't actually go back to the root words, the Hebrew, the Greek, the whatever, and actually dig into it. And I never realized this. The first couple of times was in the Greek word translated to agape. And then the third time Jesus used the word translated into Greek phileo. Who knew? All we, we read them verses and we said, we, we literally read love three times. And not one of us in this room thought in our mind of any different love than what we know in our English language. So the third time he said phileo, signifying affection, affinity, or brotherly love, and asked, in effect, are you even my friend? <laughs> right? That's crazy. Are you even my friend? Each time Peter responded with the word translated into Greek as phileo. Jesus doesn't settle for a quick, superficial answers. He has a way of getting to the heart of the matter. Peter had to face his, and I circle this, true feelings and motives when Jesus confronted him. How would you respond if Jesus asked you, do you love me? Do you really love me? Are you even, are you even my friend? Okay. And sometimes for me, if I don't work through a few of my doubts, when Jesus asks me that, I might give Jesus the same answer. Yeah, uh-huh, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, but until I actually sit down and I'm like, this is a big deal. King Jesus asked me a question. The one that we say, right, and again, with, with my grandpa passing, when somebody passes in your family or in your close inner circle, you will start asking questions again and again, and mm -hmm. you need to think about that. Is Jesus real? Is this real? And am I sold out to it? Am I truly sold out to it? Yeah. Okay, Peter might have been stuck on phileo love, so this is what I had wrote before. Peter might have been stuck on phileo love, and Jesus asked him to move to a sold out, full on agape love. And, and that was all that I had um, for the, the sermon part. And I'll just take a few minutes. So I just wrote question and answers here. And as you can see, we talked about the church and then we talked about it for 40 minutes getting to the answer. So some of these answers, we can just say, yep, it's real, check the box and move on. But sometimes we need to actually take the time, dissect it, and then it's done with. And then down the road, somebody's going to be like, yes, we talked about that in our church. And we got to the root of, of things. So I just wrote questions and answers, the one doubt. If you're in the church, or and even especially if you're out of the church, but some people, they show up to church and they have this simple question, is Jesus real, right? And I had wrote from a historical perspective, dig into the history books, boys and girls. The atheists I talk to, I'm like, you'll read all about World War I and II and you'll just, it's real. Jesus, dig into the historical books, he was real. Yes, without a doubt, I am certain based on historical evidence the same historical evidence that World War I and World War II happened. Uh, was that actually your doubt or your question, though? And generally, it's not. No, it probably wasn't. I have a quick question for you, though, so we can work through this together. If you were to pick the best leader, teacher, the best person in human history who embodied all attributes of perfection, who would it be? If you went away for a year... Not a day, a year. If you went away for an extended time and actually hit the books and really dug into this, again, atheists, agnostics, whoever, they will come to you with a million questions to defend your faith. And I say, well, 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 I need to stop just for one second and I need to ask you a question. Why, why do I always have to be on the defense? Why can't you be on the defense? And I want you to go away from a year with your worldview, because there's a lot on the line. There's everything on the line. Right. I need you to give me some serious thought and to go away for one year. And you need to look at the top 20 names known on the planet. Bill Gates, Elon Musk, Jesus Christ. Okay, we're going to stack all these names up by whatever standard you want. We're going to put the top 20 in there. King Solomon, he's going to be in that list. And then you're going to come back uh, 
and Jesus is going to be the clear winner every time, yeah, every right. single time, right? If you've actually done your homework mm -hmm. and you decided to write that story, win or lose, win or lose, it's going to be Jesus Christ. And at that point, if you're a skeptic or an atheist or whatever, you're already building a case against what I've said. That's the problem is because when you speak of something that has the name Jesus Christ into it, we can start building a wall against it. And we'll start to kick back against it. And I don't understand why. It, well, it's the power of that name. You are already building a case against what I just said. Follow the evidence. Write the story. Win or lose. The more sure you are about something, the less room there is for foundational doubt. And remember, when you're looking at your faith, I'm not talking about the top of the pile. I'm talking about the stuff that's at the bottom. At some point when something goes wrong in our lives and our apple cart is upside down and we will ask that question. If God is real, how could this happen in the world? If Jesus cares about all the little children, why is, why is this happening? And at some point in our lives, I believe we all have them questions that they come along and then I ask, is this, this question to build your faith or to tear it down? Where is this question coming from and what are you going to do with it? Um, so they're for foundational doubt. There are always questions, but are they for growth or erosion? And we're going to close with Matthew 18, 2 to 4. Jesus called the little child to him and put him among them. Or put the child among them. Then he said, I tell you the truth, unless you turn from your sins and become like little children you will never get into the kingdom of heaven. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And it's not always, always the case, but a high percentage, I would say the older we get, the more distraction of the, the world that has infected itself upon us, the more stubborn, the more Dutch you'll become, no, the more stubborn you'll become. <laughs> And, and sometimes you'll roll along and you'll be 70, 80, 90 years old and, and, and you just, you've got so set into patterns that you don't even want to think of anything of an alternative. And so every time that I hit a roadblock in my life, I often come back to the faith of a child. It's like I go to the whiteboard and there's everything that I had built up on my little, my little tower up high and sometimes I have to wipe that all off till I get down to the three or four bottom rows of foundation. And then I'm like, that's why. I look at DNA. I look at human, the way that we've, whatever, the way we can see, the way we can hear, the reproductive, all of the organs. And I'm like, oh, we were created. And then zoom, back I go again, right? But sometimes I just need to knock off all of the top level of the things that I've heard on Google or Netflix or whatever, and then just get down to that foundational childlike faith, and then away I go again. So hopefully we'll be able to work through some of these questions over the, the coming weeks, and then uh, we'll go from there. Mm -hmm.